right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nikolai and I'm the technical lead at Ubisoft Massive. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, global illumination in Tom Classes The Division. Uh, before we begin, I've been asked to remind you to turn down your mobile phones uh, and to fill out your evaluations at the end. Uh, and if you've got questions at the end, please uh, step up to the mics at the aisle. So, a couple of words very briefly about The Division. It's an open world online RPG and it's based on Massive's in-house Snowdrop engine. Uh, so today I'm going to cover Snowdrop's solution for uh, ambient lighting, uh, which we call pre-computed radiance transfer probes, or PRT probes for short. Uh, with PRT probes, what we can get is an accurate uh, approximation of global illumination in real time, uh, both on consoles and on PC. Uh, we support dynamic light sources such as the sun, the sky, uh, point spot, and area lights as well. Uh, and we are able to evaluate the light bounce from these light sources with a great degree of accuracy. Our method was developed with production in mind, and it's uh, fast, uh, it's GPU-friendly, and also has very low memory requirements. So with uh, PRT probes, Lights can be added, removed or modified without needing to rebake, and this provides instant feedback to our lighting artists. We use exactly the same techniques, both for indoors and outdoors, uh, and we also take special care to prevent light bleeding, uh, the light coming through building walls and also between interior rooms. So here are some comparison images which uh, show the contribution of the PRT probes. Uh, at the top, we have the normal output of our renderer. And at the bottom, I've turned off the ambient lighting and replaced it with a solid black color, so you can see the contribution better. So here are some more examples from more indoor type areas this time. Again, top is the normal output, and at the bottom you can see what happens when we uh, switch off the ambient lighting completely. So here's the agenda of the talk today. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a very high-level overview of the features of our approach. Next, I'm going to talk about uh, how we pre-compute the radiance transfer online, offline, sorry. Uh, then we get to the more interesting and exciting parts about what we do at runtime on the GPU. And finally, um, I'm going to talk about some of the problems that we encountered during production, and I'm going to show you some ugly screenshots. So, the division is set in an open world. Our version of Manhattan is uh, quite large, in more than six square kilometers. We have almost two million total entities placed throughout the environment. Uh, our artists have hand-placed uh, about uh, 22,000 vehicles and about 28,000 garbage piles. Um, and the size of the world and the number of objects in it uh, makes traditional methods such as light mapping, static light mapping, unfeasible for production. In order to manage our costs, it was clear that we had to do with a probe-based approach. And as probably most of you know here, uh, light probes or irradiance volumes are kind of similar to a 3D light map. So rather than using a UV texture set to index them, use the position and the normals of whatever it is that you render. So from the production point of view, this is very good because the artists don't have to worry about unwrapping uh, UVs. We also don't have to trigger a rebake whenever somebody just changes slightly a model. And this is especially important when you have a lot of... Um, models that are placed throughout the world, that are instanced throughout the world, for example, a generic uh, car or a generic brick wall. So, the division also features a day-night cycle, and because of this, the quality of the ambient lighting becomes really important. Our artists can't really cheat and set the sun direction to make their environment uh, look as good as possible. And also due to the tall buildings that we have in New York, um, 
we have certain areas that are uh, in shadow throughout the day. Uh, so they can only receive ambient lighting. The PRT probes allow our artists to tweak the lighting for any particular time of day and immediately provide an ac accurate approximation of the global illumination at that point. Uh, and they can do that without waiting for a long rebake process. During the night, our main source, source of lighting comes from local lights, uh, point spot and aerial lights which are placed throughout the world. We don't do the typical Hollywood night thing where you get still a strong um, directional light, but just blue. So in the previous iteration of our technology, this uh, that we did for Far Cry, uh, the secondary bounce from these lights would have to be actually baked inside of the probes. But for the division, what we were able to do is to make these light sources completely dynamic and, dynamic and also editable as well. The lights can be freely added, you can remove them, you can modify them as you wish, and you also get instant feedback as to how a specific environment will look uh, during the night. The division also features many interior spaces. Um, a lot of these are often very large and densely propped. Our artists try to light them in a realistic way. As a general rule, we don't use hacks such as negative lights. And we also try to avoid doing things like artificially raising the uh, ambient light level. Instead, we just solely rely on the PRT probes uh, to get good lighting. A lot of the interiors also have large windows and openings, and as such are affected by the day-night cycle as well. Uh, so this all fits together quite nicely with our probe-based approach. However, we have to take special care in order to prevent light bleeding between the different rooms. We also support different weather conditions in the division. Uh, so we have clear sky, we have overcast, we have snowstorms, and even we have blizzards. And the weather in game is actually randomized by a script that runs uh, on the server. Each weather preset defines its own lighting, and the artist can tweak, tweak things such as the sun, the sky color, the cloud type, the density of the clouds, and so on and so forth. Uh, one interesting thing is that the weather preset also determines how much snow is going to build up on the different surfaces. Um, and this is if, if effectively changing the BRDF, or the shaders of the surfaces on the fly. Uh, it would be a problem if we were to go with a completely static GI solution, but uh, because of the way we do PRT, uh, this we can achieve quite easily with just a few shader instructions and at minimal rendering cost. So let me show you now a brief time lapse of, uh, of how everything fits together inside the game. So the white spheres uh, that you see here are the probes where we've computed the lighting. And uh, you can see how the ambient lighting changes as the sun moves across the sky. Uh, so they get the correct light bounce from, uh, from the buildings and from the street. Here we have an example of the different weather conditions. Suddenly it becomes a lot foggier. Uh, and this is where our volumetric uh, fog solution is going to kick in. Finally, at night, we see that most of the illumination actually comes from uh, the street lights. And here we have another example of the volumetric fog being affected by the probes as well. So after this brief introduction, let's now go into detail about how we implemented uh, PRT inside Snowdrop. So pre-computed radius transfer, or PRT, refers to a family of rendering techniques where we figure out what the light transport is between surfaces for a particular fixed scene. And this PRT, we can store it per vertex, uh, in a texture, or in the props, just like we did for Far Cry. Um, in the space of this presentation, I can only give you just a very short uh, background on PRT, but if you want to get more information, I recommend looking at the course notes from SIGGRAPH 2005. They're really good. Uh, so in PRT, in general, we only can support distant light sources, 
uh, such as a HDR environment probe uh, or directional lights. For Far Cry 3, I did develop a solution where we could also support dynamic local lights, but unfortunately they turned out to be too heavy and inaccurate and it didn't make it to the final release. Uh, high frequency shadows are also possible, um, but so far I have not been particularly suited to games, unfortunately, because of the complicated shaders that are required. Uh, so in the bottom image here, you can see an example of PRT done with a nonlinear wavelet basis. So you can see the sharp shadows and the uh, reflections. And generally, that's just not possible uh, on the GPUs with that particular wavelet-based approach. So to get around with these limitations, what we did was we just decided to use brute force. Uh, rather than looking for something elegant and compact to represent PRT, like all of these academic papers do, uh, we just tore an explicit list of all of the surfaces that are visible from a particular probe. So we have a list of surfaces or surfal elements. Uh, each one of them has a position, albedo on the normal, uh, so color in the normal, uh, and various other attributes, uh, such as how much snow can build up, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's quite similar to having a G buffer cube map per probe, but not quite. Um, here is our circle, circle debug view, uh, which hopefully will make this a little bit more clear. So for each probe, what we do is uh, we draw a green line from the probe towards the surface that that probe sees. So I said it's kind of similar to a GBOF cube map, but you can also think of it as firing lots of rays from the probes and just storing the first uh, hit. You just store the surface properties there. So for each direction where we don't have any geometry, we assume that the sky is visible. And what that gives us is a spherical shadow term per probe. Uh, it's somewhat similar to a large scale directional ambient occlusion. And you can see in these two images to the right how this works compared to SSAO. SSAO is a lot more local and enhances basically the corners of the objects. Uh, the pre-computed sky visibility, on the other hand, works on a much larger scale and can pick up occlusion from the uh, train tunnel, tunnel in this case and from some of the buildings. And since we're using probes, uh, we, can't, we can't only pre-compute uh, radiance transfer for just a particular normal. We have to do it for the entire sphere. Um, and the way we do it is... Uh, the way we, we did it for the Far Cry series, um, with a transfer basis. Uh, so in the top left image here, uh, you can see the light probe, uh, the HDR light probe of Grace Cathedral. Uh, top right, you see the cosine convolution, which tells us how a purely diffuse surface is going to be illuminated from that particular light probe. And what we're looking for is to get a compact representation of the light, of the cosine convolution of the light probe, or to compress it in some way. And one standard way to do this is to represent it as coefficients of a particular transfer basis. And here at the bottom, I've shown you um, a comparison of two of the most common choices that you can have for transfer basis in PRT. Uh, bottom left, we have second order spherical harmonics. Uh, they are somewhat equivalent to having like a principal light direction. So in this example, that will be my principal light direction and, and a single ambient value. And the usual problem with that is if you have two strong light sources coming from the opposite directions, then you only can raise the ambient value, but you lose any sense of directionality. Uh, on the plus side, this is actually very good for GPUs because you can just store it as uh, four floating point values. And to the bottom right, uh, we can see another representation, uh, the Half-Life 2 ambient cube. Uh, this isn't a real basis. It's, uh, it's not a real orthogonal basis. It's, it's really just six vectors that are axis aligned. 
And what we do is we just compute the, uh, how much light each one of these vectors re uh, receives. So essentially what we do is we just compute the cosine convolution for six different normals. Uh, again, the problem here is that if you want to have a rotating light source, instead of actually seeing it rotate, you will see it fade in or fade out from one of the directions and then fade into the other. So it's actually just going to blend smoothly rather than actually seeing it rotate. And this is because the basis vectors are fixed. Um, on the other hand, after evaluating different choices for the transfer basis, we finally settled on the Half-Life 2 ambient cube basis, which is also quite GPU friendly as it only requires six uh, floats. So very shortly, what we do is we just compute pre-computed radiance transfer for the six normals, and we, at runtime, what we'll do is just a single blend between those six vectors. And here you can see the, um, the isolated irradiance from each particular direction. So uh, top, sorry, uh, left, right, top, bottom, front, and back. So essentially, if we want to shade something, we just figure out how to blend properly between the, these uh, six different values. So let me talk about how we actually generate radiance transfer. We have to start with placing the probes in the world. And we do this automatically in two major ways. Uh, first, we have a grid of raycasts that are spread four meters apart. So we just uh, fire a ray top down and we spawn a probe at every hit. We also do a bunch of additional raycasts in order to, um, to move the probe slightly to nudge it so that it doesn't intersect any objects. Uh, one other thing that we do is we also automatically spawn probes alongside the building walls, and this helps to make a smooth gradient and to prevent the buildings from looking flat. And most, most of this is down to the sky visibility that we also compute because the probes at the bottom are going to be a lot darker than the probes that are at the top. So how do we store that data on disk? Uh, we divide... Uh, the probes into a 2D grid uh, of sectors. Each sector is 64 by 64 meters and can hold a maximum of 1,000 probes. Uh, typically, we expect to have about 300 to 400 probes. I think the maximum that we've seen is about 960. And that sort of depends on how many buildings you've got uh, inside of a particular area, how tall they are, how many floors you've got for a particular interior, and so on. So we store the probes simply as just a very simple array, but you can probably also try to organize them in some sort of bounding volume hierarchy in order to be able to do spatial queries fast. And these sectors at runtime, uh, they're streamed in uh, as the player moves around. We keep a maximum of uh, 25 sectors loaded at any one time. So if we want to relight a large number of probes every frame, you can't just store the list of surface per probe and try to relight that. It's just going to be too slow. Uh, so what we have to do is some optimizations in order to have the GPU do less work per frame. And to do that, the first trick that we do is that in each sector, all of the probes are actually sharing the same surface, surface. Um, this way, we can relight all the surface in one go and then the probes will actually reference those and not do any duplicate work. Um, and you can see that this would actually work quite nicely here. Uh, in the images to the right, you can see that the probes the, reference the same, roughly the same surface all the time. So with that, we're, we're actually able to reduce the number of, the number of surfaces that we relight on the GPU quite dramatically. And you could use a very sophisticated clustering algorithm here, uh, but we just didn't have enough time to implement it, so we just went with a very sim simple two-level hash grid. Uh, I'm going to show you some details of that uh, right now. So we have two levels for our grid, and the first level, uh, each cell in the grid overages the positions, the normals, the colors, and everything else for the surface. Uh, 
we use the circle position and also the principal normal direction of the circle in order to index into the grid. And we do that in order to avoid overaging circles that have drastically different uh, opposite directions. So the cell, si cell size here for this grid determines how much work you're going to have to do at runtime in order to, um, to compute the lighting. And you have to be careful here, because if you set this two cores, uh, you're going to have problems, for example, with narrow spotlights, because you're just simply evaluating the, uh, the lighting at a, very, uh, at a very coarse grid. Uh, we found that for our game, one meter cube was actually a very good compromise between performance and quality. So the second grid level averages multiple surfaces into one irradiance brick. Uh, and this is an optimization that is required in order to reduce the amount of work we have to do per probe. So rather than the probe referencing each individual surfaces, it actually references a brick instead. So you have to do a lot less computation per probe here. And again, you kind of have to be careful here. Uh, if you set this size too large, then you're going to have inaccuracies. If you set it too small, then your performance is not going to be that great. And for us, uh, four meter cube cell size works quite nicely. So now we're going to go through a very high level overview of how we actually store all of that data on disk. Uh, so for each sector, we have our array of probes that you can see here on the left. Each probe has its own position and also the Half-Life 2 ambient cube coefficients for the sky visibility. So we only store the sky visibility per probe. It also has a range, uh, two indices, into an array of brick factors. So a brick factor basically defines how much um, influence uh, how much light a particular probe receives from our irradiance brick. And again, we just have Half-Life 2 ambient coefficients, so six float values. Uh, and also we have a particular, and we also have a brick index that is a uh, index into our irradiance array, uh, irradiance brick array. So the, bricks is, the brick is very simple. It just has two indices that define a range inside the surfoil array that you see here on to the right. And finally, we get to the last part, the surfoils, where we just store anything that we need to do in order to be able to relight them. So their position, their color, the normal, and any other attributes. So... In order to generate this, um, we have an offline baking process. We start by rendering gbuffer cube maps for all the probes inside a certain sector. We read back the gbuffers to the CPU. We unproject the texels, the cube map texels, and compress the normals, and so on and so forth. After we've done with rendering all of the cube maps, uh, what we do is we put the surface into the hash grid in order to get uh, the Overage surfers and also the irradiance bricks. And as we do that on the CPU, we can start actually rendering the other sectors that are in the queue. So we do that interleaved. And all of this takes around uh, five to six seconds per sector. Again, it really depends on how many probes and what geometry you're going to have in that particular part of the world. Um, so for the Manhattan map, that equates to about one gigabyte of data on disk. Uh, we have about 4,000 sectors, uh, one million probe and 56 million surfaces. And we can generate the entire data set offline in about eight hours. But uh, here, our lighting artists don't ever have to do that uh, manually. And they can only do it once and then work off of that particular nightly uh, set of data. So I hope everybody is still awake after that. Uh, and we're going to go to the more exciting part, the rendering, what's happening at runtime on the GPU. So super high level summary of what we're doing every frame. Um, and I'm going to go into details about each one of these super shortly. 
Uh, we start by relighting all the circles and the bricks. Uh, so this is uh, simply calculating the lighting at every circle and then summing it up for a particular brick. Uh, very simple. Uh, the next thing that we do is we relight the probes. Uh, we compute the lighting that comes from the sky, and then we just add it to the lighting that uh, is referenced by uh, every single brick. And finally, at the bottom here, we put everything into an irradiance volume. Uh, so this is just... Uh, this is just a normal volume texture that has a single RGB color for each, uh, each one of the six uh, directions, and we use that for shading. So each frame, we start by taking our PRT data for the probes. We plug in the new lighting environment and get the probe irradiance back. And this is not just a simple blend between different uh, irradiance solutions for different times of day and allows us to have very accurate lighting at a specific time and to capture GI effects that are otherwise impossible to capture because they're very short duration. And here to the right you have an example of such an effect. Uh, so in the left image we get a strong orange light bounce that's coming from the tarpaulin uh, because it's directly illuminated by the sun. And this happens only for a very few minutes during the day. Um, so if you were to do, uh, to basically pre-compute irradiance for certain times of the day, you have to be either very lucky or sample it quite, uh, uh, quite densely in order to be able to capture that. And at other times, the tarpaulin is in shadow, so the wall of the building is primarily illuminated by the sun and the bounce from, uh, from the street. So how do we do that? It's actually super, very surprisingly simple. Uh, this is some pseudocode. Uh, for me as a programmer, it's quite easy to understand this. I hope it will be for you as well. Um, first, we compute the radiance at every brick. Uh, for each brick, we just go through the list of every circle, we compute the lighting there, and finally we uh, overage, uh, overage that for that particular brick. And that compute lighting function is nothing more but like in your uh, deferred shading function, you can just reuse that uh, given the normal, the position, the uh, albedo, you can just compute your lighting from that one as well. So as the sun lighting and the shadowing is evaluated per circle, we can achieve much better accuracy than our previous PRT methods, such as the one that we used in Far Cry 3, where the shadowing term was just approximated per probe with uh, some spherical harmonics coefficients. And here we can see the difference that this makes. Um, we have a scene here where the sun direction changes uh, changes throughout the day, and the irradiance of the sun, uh, isolated here to the right, changes quite dramatically. Uh, we just have a difference of, uh, what is it, three hours? And you can see how much difference it makes just for the solution. And this is something that you cannot very easily capture with PRT, and you also have to sample quite densely if we were going to, uh, for different probe sets and computing them for a specific time of day. So one thing that you have to be careful about if you're going to implement this is that the dynamic shadow map from the sun actually follows the player and is only guaranteed to cover the visible frustum and not all of the surfaces. So any surfaces that are outside of the frustum uh, do not have a valid shadow map, so depending on your indexing mode, you will just get strange results. Uh, and to illustrate the disastrous effects of this, what I've done is I've just completely turned the shadow from the sun. And you can see that it sort of looks all right, but you get like a weird ambience where certain objects are illuminated even though they are completely in shadow. So this is just incorrect. Um, we could solve this by rendering a dedicated uh, shadow map that would cover all of the uh, surfaces, but that would be too expensive. So what we do instead is we just keep track, uh, we just keep a history of whether a particular circle has a valid shadow sample, and we just use the last known value. Uh, 
uh, and it's kind of okay because the sun doesn't actually change direction that, that fast. So another improvement over our previous PRT implementation is that we can easily incorporate local light sources, uh, point spot area lights. Uh, what you have to do is sur simply to light each circle with this and you automatically get the correct light bounce um, in that compute lighting function that we saw on, in the pseudocode. And in order to do this, we just have to do a little bit of extra work on the CPU in order to figure out which lights intersect the sector's bounding box. And then we just simply um, store these, their properties into GPU constants and upload them to the GPU, and then we're done. Uh, one nice optimization uh, that we also do is that lights that are marked as static, so you can't actually shoot them or they won't change, uh, they won't blink, or they won't move. Uh, we just store them in a separate buffer. We compute them once and then store them and just re-add them. And uh, this allowed us to support many more light sources than I thought originally would be possible. So I'm going to show you now a quick video of uh, how dynamic light sources work with uh, Snowdrop. So here what we have is a spotlight, very bright spotlight that is uh, shining towards the wall. And the wall is multicolored, it's got like these different tiles. So as the light moves, it uh, lights up the tiles and then the probes capture the bounce from them. So you get this really nice multicolored effect. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, um, each one of our weather presets also defines how much snow is going to build up on the different surfaces. And in order to support this, we just store a tiny bit of data that uh, tells us how much snow is supposed to accumulate on that particular surface. So then simply when we relight the bricks, we read the value from the weather preset of how much snow we're supposed to go, and then we just lerp uh, between the original uh, the original color of the surface and purely white. And you can see here a comparison of what it looks like to the right here. Uh, here to the left, I've turned the effect off. So what you get is like this, uh, still kind of correct, but not quite um, grayish ambience that's coming to the probe. And to the right, you have a much more pronounced white ambient light from the bottom. So it works really nicely and it's very cheap. So as some of you probably figure out by now, we only pre-compute a single bounce uh, for the surface for the PRT. And in order to simulate additional bounces, uh, one of our programmers figured out a very nice way to do that. Uh, we just use the computed irradiance from the previous frame and we feed it back to the current surface when we do the lighting. So each circle uh, just stores an index to the probe that is closest to it and just uh, uses that as an ambient lighting term. And this feedback loop allows us to capture the, loud the light bouncing from, the light from the sky bouncing from the floor. And you can see the effect here in the bottom image here. Um, just a little bit of a close up. Uh, if you just use a single bounce, then the ceilings are gonna be quite dark. Once you turn on the feedback loop, then suddenly everything gets a lot more correctly illuminated. Couple more comparison images uh, to the left. So here we have an outdoor environment and the feedback loop just makes everything brighter and brings up the bottom of the light probes. Uh, so it illuminates the bottom of the objects. So even though it works very nicely for outdoor environments, for indoor environments, it's not, the effect is not quite as pronounced. Here again to the left you see the effect of a single bounce and to the right you see the effect when we turn on the feedback loop. So you can see just a tiny, tiny bit of difference where the probes are a little bit brighter, but in reality it doesn't give you much. <laughs> 
So the next thing that uh, we have to do after we've done the bricks and the radians uh, from, from the bricks, uh, we have to go through each probe and relight the probes. So first what we do is we compute the radians from the sky. Uh, for that, it's a very simple process. We render the entire sky to a, simple, to a very small texture. And then we project, uh, we compute the cosine convolution of that and we store it as just uh, basis coefficients of the Half-Life 2 ambient cube basis. And then all that we have to do here is just to multiply that with the sky visibility that is stored inside of the probe. So why do we have to render a small texture? Uh, mainly because our skybox uses a large combination of techniques which are difficult to express analytically. We do have the Prism sky model, but also on top of that we have these uh, six-point lighting cloud textures that allow us to dynamically relight them based on where the sun is. Uh, so here you see the same scene with different sky configurations. The base sky color is the same for both scenes, but at the top you don't really have any clouds and you have this blue type ambience which is captured by the probes. And on the bottom you have quite, quite, quite a lot more sky coverage, so the, the sky is actually more grayish rather than blue. And this is also correctly captured uh, inside of the, from our PRT solution in Snowdrop. This is another example where we have this time the same clouds, the same base sky color, but we've just moved the sun, so it's like at sunset or sunrise, I don't quite remember. So in one of the, uh, in one of the cases, the clouds are very orangey, and uh, to the bottom you see it during, uh, during the day, so the clouds are now whitish. And you can see how this is also correctly reflected uh, in the light probes. So finally, what we have to do after we've computed the radiance from the sky, we just simply have to add the lighting that comes from the sky with the lighting that comes from the bricks, and then we get the final result. So we just go through all of our brick factors and add them up, that's it. And then we're done, we've got the uh, probes completely relit. Uh, so let's talk about the thing that you're probably very interested in, the performance. I have to preface this by saying that the performance kind of depends on where you are in the world, how many probes you've got, how many circles, and so on. But the numbers I'm going to give you are quite representative. So every frame, what we do is we relight two full sectors, the one that the player is in, and also we choose one other from the sectors that are currently loaded. <coughs> So this is done in a GPU com compute task uh, just right after the shadow rendering. We actually have two compute tasks, one to relight the uh, circles and bricks, and one to relight the probes themselves. So this is also done with an um, async compute shader on consoles, which is uh, running at the same time as we do the G buffer rendering. Uh, some example timings. Uh, for the Xbox One, it takes about one millisecond. Uh, we time this by putting the compute shader in non-async mode. Uh, normally, though, this, this runs async, and it doesn't really matter if we turn it on and off. It's just absolutely the same performance. It does, it's not that expensive at all. Uh, and the time here is roughly split uh, 60 uh, percent, 40 percent between lighting bricks and surfaces versus lighting probes. On the PC, on a GTX 760, it takes about half a millisecond to do the same, uh, the same amount of data. And the timing here is roughly split 50-50 between lighting bricks and lighting probes. So once we've run the um, relighting compute shader, the next step is to put all of the radiance data into one volume map. And we do this in order to have trilinear filtering and in order to support large objects or small objects. 
the volume map follows the camera and covers 100 by, by 50 by 100 meters with 32 by 16 by 32 voxels. And we use a single texture for all of the six basis directions. And the shader uh, computes just an offset into that texture in order to figure out where to read from. So this volume map is used both in the deferred lighting pass and the forward lighting pass. So we have consistent, um, uh, consistent lighting between purely opaque objects and also uh, transparent objects or particles. So 100 by 50 by 100 meters with such a relatively uh, low dimensional volume map will create probe bleeding. So this is just the effect where you have the trilinear filtering reading the wrong value. So basically you have the effect of a light bleeding through a thin surface such as, a, such as the wall of a building. And you hear at the top right, you can see an example of this. Um, what happens is that the probes on the outside get illuminated by the sky. And this uh, incorrectly illuminates the interior, the entrance here. So you get like this sort of wrong bluish ambience. And in order to fix this, we use a separate volume texture for both indoor and outdoor. Uh, we, for, for a particular model, we know which room it is, and we write that value inside the stencil buffer. Then in the deferred lighting pass, what we can do is we can read from the stencil and figure out whether to read from the outdoor or from the indoor, um, uh, from the indoor volume texture. We also try to prevent bleeding between different rooms. And we do that by determining what the extent of the room is in volume space and then clumping our reads just to, uh, just to this particular AABB uh, in the volume map. And of course, this only works if you have rooms which are axis aligned. And you can see the effects of these fixes in the bottom right here. So we have a lot more correct ambience, so the entrance uh, to the staircase is a lot, uh, looks a lot more natural. Outside of the volume map, we shade using a 2D, uh, large 2D texture, which we call the fallback texture. And this is a single 2D texture that covers the entire world. Each texel inside of it represents a single sector probe, and we compute the information for that by just placing a probe like very high up in the environment. And for this one, we don't actually do any of the light bounces, we just compute the irradiance from the sky. So you can see the effect of the distance shading in these two comparison images. Um, to the left, I've turned it off completely. So the buildings far down the street are now suddenly completely black. And to the right, I've turned it back on, and you can see that it's almost like an invisible blend uh, between the volume map and the fallback texture. So it works rather nicely. As pretty much everybody else, we use uh, ambient occlusion as a shadow term for the indirect lighting. Ambient occlusion can come from a couple of sources. So things like SSAO, uh, it can be baked into the models, into the materials, into the textures as well. And it also comes from the sky visibility of the probes. Uh, so for SSAO and the baked in ambient occlusion, we store it in a separate uh, channel with our G buffer. Ideally, what you want to do is to only to use this ambient occlusion for the sky term only. Uh, so you don't really want to apply that to the secondary bounce that's coming from the bricks. But we kind of cheat here and apply it to everything in order to uh, not having to store uh, two terms and not having to use more than one volume map. So one of the things that we found during the project is that it's difficult to make SSEO good underneath vehicles. One of our tech artists came up with this uh, cool way to fake ambient occlusion with just a screen space projected decal. And you can see the difference that this makes in the comparison images to the right. At the top, the decals are switched off 
So the, the vehicle kind of looks disconnected from the street. Whereas at the bottom, you suddenly get this idea that it's actually something that's grounded and it actually casts a shadow. And this is just done with a very simple texture box, box in the vehicle prop. You can see here some screenshots from our Snowdrop editor. The vehicle isn't just a simple model, it's actually a node graph with a lot of parameters that you can tweak. And you can also place, place these additional uh, primitives inside of it. In that case, it's just an invisible box that has a uh, simple gradient texture, and that texture just writes out to, uh, to the dedicated G buffer channel. Uh, it's very simple, but it also works surprisingly well. So Snowdrop also uses uh, the PRT probes in the volumetric fog rendering. Uh, we just use uh, the standard ray marching and sample the um, lighting environment in order to simulate scattering from participating media particles. Um, in addition to the sun and the local lights, we also sample the ambient lighting that comes from the probes themselves. As an optimization, we store the average irradiance for all of the six bases direction in a separate volume map, so just a single RGB volume map. And this is what uh, we actually sample and do trilinear filtering on as we're uh, ray marching. Uh, and it kind of works because the scattering is supposed to scatter in all directions. So taking the average ambient lighting is correct in this case. So we've come to the final section of the presentation where I'm going to talk to you about some of the problems that we encountered with our approach during production. And as promised, I'm going to show you some ugly screenshots. Uh, so Snowdrop initially was using an irradiance volume, like pretty much a lot of other games. But with a twist, instead of having a baking step for the probes offline, what we would do is we would render cube maps on the fly and then store them on disk. So as you were walking around, we would render the cube maps and store them in a cache. And this works very nicely with one major drawback is that the update rate isn't really fast enough. So what you could see is visible light pop, like a particular area would be dark and suddenly boom, it would become bright as we, uh, we render the probes. And as a whole, we decided that this wasn't quite suitable for our requirements, like the day-night cycle or the dynamic lighting. You just couldn't get it to work fast enough in order to uh, in order to have the dynamic lighting that we wanted. So when we switched to PRT probes, we started with eight basis vectors that covered the entire sphere. And you can see those eight basis vectors as the white dots on the probes there. Uh, this worked fine, except that at some point, the artist noticed that the streets were a bit too dark. They just couldn't put their finger quite on why, but everything seemed a little bit too dark. So we sat down and eventually realized that it was because none of the vectors actually pointed straight up or straight down. So this meant that the light from the sky or the bounce from the street, we couldn't actually represent it properly. We could just blend between two vectors that were pointing this way. So for that reason, we decided to go back to Half-Life 2 ambient cube bases. And it uses six bases vectors, which is fewer, so you would think it's less accurate, but it actually is better for our needs because there's one vector that points straight up so it can capture the lighting from the uh, sky accurately, and then there's another one that points straight down so it can capture the bounce from the terrain on the streets. During production, we also had occasional problems where the automatic pro placement algorithm would decide that it was going to stop working properly. And for various reasons, probes would not be spawned in certain areas, uh, and this causes dark spots in the irradiance volume, so like places where we just don't have any lighting information. And to the right here, we have one such uh, location. We have uh, this particular building, and on one of, on two of the floors, you just don't have any probes. And you can also kind of see it on the, uh, uh, on the crane there to the right as well. 
Uh, and this is just caused because the, the probes just miss the crane completely, so you don't spawn anything there. And we have also a special debug tool for these situations, which would color these areas with uh, a highlight color so that we can easily spot them. And to solve problems like this is not fun and also requires quite a lot of coder effort. And we're thinking that the way to address this in the future is to give the artists more control over how the probes are placed. So to allow them to add new probes, to move the automatic probes around in order to adjust things and to fine tune all of the details. Uh, one other possibility that we were thinking about is to support UV mapping for the buildings, so for large structures. So effectively what we would do is we would compute the same sort of PRT, but instead of six direction, we would just compute it for the for three direction in the tangent space. And this allow us to this will allow our artists to control the resolution of the PRT a lot more effectively. So we also have the problem that sometimes probes are missing from indoor entrances. And because we have the outdoor and indoor volumes, this presents itself as a sharp line transition between the indoors and the outdoors. Uh, and you can see it here in the comparison images to the right, where I've just isolated the ambient lighting. So one way to solve this is to automate the placement of the probes uh, so that we spawn them at particular entrances and windows. Unfortunately, we only thought of that quite late during the production, so this didn't make it in the final game. Uh, luckily for us, these type of artifacts are not so visible when you have full shading on because the change in material actually masks the transition as well. So one of the other areas where we thought we could improve is the resolution of our solution. Uh, it's fairly easy to change the grid sizes and so on. Uh, so it's just a bunch of parameters that you put into the baking, but you have to be careful about the performance cost. Uh, in order for us to increase the resolution of the probes, what we have to do is to look into optimizing the baking times first, and also to optimize the compression, um, just because we don't want to blow up our memory budget. And as I mentioned as well, we only pre-compute a single bounce, um, and we, appro the, we approximate the rest with uh, just coarsely at runtime. And this is primarily because we just didn't have enough time to make a more complicated uh, complex uh, solver offline. But I think as we move on to for the next iteration of Snowdrop, what we have to do is actually to bite the bullet and to implement a proper GPU path tracer that will allow us to capture the multiple bounces when we bake the probes. So finally, just a couple of words. Uh, our tech, Snowdrop, was developed at the same time as the division. And because of time constraints, sometimes we did not have enough time to do proper bug fixing. Uh, instead, we just gave the artist some parameters and say, here, tweak this until it kind of looks right. Uh, so this effectively sort of hides the problem, but doesn't really solve them. And at the end, what happened was that we have a huge mess of parameters. Each one of them had sort of obscure effects or once we fix, the, we fix the bugs, we just disconnected it in order not to, um, uh, for it not to mess up the solution. So some things straight up don't work, some things don't work as expected. And it's very confusing for the lighting artists because they don't know which things actually have, uh, which things actually will allow them to tweak the lighting. And this sort of showed us that proper bug fixing is very important rather than just uh, giving some numbers to the artists and letting them tweak things by themselves. So we were thinking that for the next iteration of Snowdrop, we have to simplify the interface and just provide just a couple of intuitive uh, sliders that people can tweak. Okay, uh, I have to thank all of my colleagues at Massive uh, at the end of the presentation, especially Einar and Dennis, who did uh, a lot of the work. So if you got any questions, this is my email. Uh, the website's for Massive and for Ubisoft. Uh, 
so we're done. I think we have about five minutes for questions. I would like you to step up to the microphone, please. And yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing. Good idea. And I have a question. Uh, how long does it take uh, to bake and uh, placement proof? Many, many right to proof. Yeah, uh, we mentioned it in one of the slides. It takes about eight hours. Of it course, does. it depends on like the speed of your engine and uh, the type of geometry that you have. And uh, um, I think uh, may, uh, there are many, many right to proof. And uh, when player uh, enter some region and uh, another region, uh, some pop-up problem occurred, I think. Uh, what, what do you, uh, how to say in English? Um, if, you, if you feel more comfortable, we can talk uh, later. Uh, so I'll be here to answer questions as well. So okay. feel free to come and uh, yeah. ask me. So I will try to, if it's a little bit easier. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, I don't know if you mentioned that. How do you update the 3D grid? Like, which grid cell corresponds to which probe in the world? That's one thing. Uh, so basically, the probes aren't really tied to any particular grid because we can spawn them at multiple locations. We also nudge them a little bit. They can be spawned at... Uh, right, right. So my question right. is, like, for each cell you find the closest probe? Uh, for three? each of the volts, yeah, that's right. So we just find the closest probe offline. Which it's just a dumb thing that just goes through each, each of the probes and figures out which one is the closest. That's it. There isn't really anything okay. more complicated. So another question is, uh, have you experimented with like cascaded approach, like having several grids, uh, like more resolution? It's, it's a good idea, I think, uh, in general. We just didn't have enough time to implement it. OK, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, did you ever have problems with um, incorrect lighting at the edge of a sector because, say, there was a large building at the edge of a sector, and then um, the sector beside it was only taking those the circles? All of the it time. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, uh, there's like all sorts of weird things that you're going to see, but most of the time they're kind of masked because we do trilinear filtering as well. So you don't just do one sector and then another sector. You actually do trilinear filtering between the two different sectors. Oh, okay. So it's kind of masked, but the problem is there. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to know uh, how you validated the accuracy of your solution. Like, do you have a path racer or anything like that? It just went out as a kind of artistic. We just tweaked it until it looked fine, and our uh, art director said, this is good. Okay, <laughs> that works. That's good enough. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, so uh, what's the disk size of the enlightened data? data? Uh, it's in one of the slides. It's about one gigs, uh, so it's fairly low. Uh, and you can basically make that as large as you want uh, by increasing the, the properties. Mm. All right. Thank you very much.